Thank you all so much. I'm really delighted to be here um, at with the OOPS uh, group. And I thought I'd just go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, I hope, um, Patty, does that seem to work well for all of you? Fantastic. Um, so again, I'm really, I'm really, uh, I'm down here in San Francisco. I work underneath my house on a steep hill in um, the city. Um, you guys are all over uh, the state of Oregon, it sounds like. But sharing this kind of passion for the ocean, I think, um, will be part of the fun of taking you into my world of the seaweeds, the intertidal zone. Um, I have been making imagery using my flatbed scanner of the marine algae for many years. It probably started in about 2009. And what I've come to feel pretty passionate about is bringing these organisms kind of out into um, to audiences who don't scuba dive, who don't get under the water, who, you know, I'm very conscious as uh, myself, I am not a scuba diver either. Um, so I sail a lot and I swim in the ocean and I will snorkel whenever I can, but I'm not a diver per se. And I'm very conscious of the fact that we can't really hike into the kelp forest. Um, uh, so we need, my mission is to bring these organisms out into us, uh, it, onto terra firma for us to, to become more um, familiar with them. So what I'm showing you here are some scans that have been printed onto fabric that's about 94 inches tall. It's in a gallery in Alameda here in San Francisco Bay. And I'll just um, name these um, seaweeds from uh, my left is the rosy red erythrophyllum. Uh, the next to the right of that is the agregia or feather boa kelp. Then you get palmaria or mollus, which is often called dulse. And then on the right is the macrocystis or uh, giant kelp. Mm -hmm. um, I had the great opportunity to be asked to enliven a very underused shopping center also on the island of Alameda. Mm -hmm. And I was given the windows of a video store shop. And that needless to say, this video store shop, I mean, this video shop had been uh, abandoned or empty for many years. So um, I put these, this fabric, uh, this dye sublimated fabric with the great macrocystis in the window. And then this whole event happened outside. There was a festival, there was music playing and food trucks and dancing and children's performances. And all the while they were encountering these organisms that they might not otherwise ever see or know about. Um, this was an installation a year ago now at a gallery in San Francisco in the financial district on Montgomery Street and these are 14 foot tall banners uh, that um, cover this dividing, this glass wall dividing the gallery from an office space behind. And again, uh, what we found uh, as above below is that this art making is it brings this wonder, this awe, and it, it kind of builds curiosity. And that's really, um, a, a, really my goal is how do you uh, make people curious, not only by, First step is looking and noticing uh, and observing, and then that hopefully will um, get you to ask some questions as it has me and take you into the science of the seaweed. So it all started for me um, down here on Duxbury Reef, which is just north of San Francisco at the very end, if you're familiar with um, the uh, Point Reyes National Seashore, it comes down to the south and ends in a reef called Duxbury Reef that is right along the um, San Andreas Fault. And I was doing an intertidal, um, I, I was becoming a docent of the reef and I was out, this was in 2009, quite a long time ago. And everyone that I was working with was talking about things like the starfish and the nudibranchs and the anemones and the fish, maybe a little octopus. And nobody was talking about what was the most of there, which was the marine algae or the seaweeds. So that's when I picked up a scrap of this red seaweed and held it up to the sky and was like, oh my goodness, I need to get this back into my studio. So this is a picture of my studio. This is where I'm sitting right now, right here. This, what you're seeing here is right to the right of me, my, my scanner. Um, and uh, this is how I create these portraits of the marine algae. So this top section that's lifted up actually has a secondary light source in it. And I take that white cover off of a piece of glass that's there. And then I close down this top 
um, with my specimen. You can kind of see my specimen on there. Um, and that secondary light source actually pushes light through the specimen as my scan is being captured. Um, and that is what allows me to make these portraits, as I call them, of um, the seaweeds that are so um, uh, um, luscious and vibrant and trans and really capturing the translucent quality of the seaweeds themselves. Um, you can see here this erythrofilum that I've scanned on the left actually has um, still some of the ocean with it. You can see the lines of where they're, where it's not dried out, it's still wet. Um, and so I'm able to scan my specimens both wet and dry. Um, I pat them so they're not soaking wet, but I can get them on there pretty fresh. Um, I just have to clean my scanner often. Which isn't a which isn't a problem. Um, on the right, you'll see I started exploring with making a little bit more abstracted or collaged um, imagery, but always so that we can actually identify the specimens that I'm using. Um, so this is um, the um, lovely Halosachion. And for those of you who have been out paddling and stopping and going into the intertidal zone, these are called sea sacks. Uh, they're actually in the red category of seaweed, even though there's this amazing celadon green color. Now these sea sacks actually take a different um, strategy towards success in the intertidal zone than other more folios or leafy seaweeds that tend to dry out as um, the low tide persists and you have um, the sun and the wind, the desiccating sun and wind. And it's good to remember that these seaweeds are really existing in this, this environment that's very strange for us. I mean, we wouldn't be able to understand if our atmosphere were kind of sucked out every six hours and came rushing in again. Um, but that's what happens with the tides, uh, with the ocean pulled out and come back in every six hours in six hour cycles. Um, so these halosachion actually hydrate from within. They keep whole little uh, bits of the ocean uh, within them. Um, they can even have whole universes. And then again, um, this is uh, on the left is uh, a whole series of scans I did of Agrigia, which is the feather boa kelp of the pods there. And you can see I made this, this was, um, designed as a poster for your kitchen. And I made this in 2013. And at that time, I was really adamant about really getting these underrepresented organisms out into places that other things really do find a home, such as, you know, I was just thinking about those posters or um, dish towels or things like that where you could find heirloom peaches or mushrooms or ferns. And at that time, you would not find um, seaweed uh, in, in those places. But now, in fact, you can find 10 years later uh, dish towels with seaweed on them. On the right, you have the Maziella volans, which is this spoon-shaped um, species of the Maziella, which is really this fabulous magenta color. Um, so as a designer, uh, you can see what incredible shape and color uh, I've had to work with. And that was really what got me going um, with continuing knowing that I just wanted to continue working with the seaweeds. Um, this is uh, to highlight the incredible variability of morphology or form or shape that these seaweeds present to us. This feathery orangey seaweed behind is actually two historical pressings called Gloeosiphonia. Um, and then I overlaid some um, uh, other seaweed colors on top of it. Uh, this exists as a big print in a couple of hospitals. Um, all of my work can exist not only here digitally, which is almost its native, its native um, format, uh, but also as big fine art prints uh, in the books um, and also as these all sorts of other installation um, situations. This is the Egregia uh, menziesii or feather boa kelp. So this I hope is one that those of you that paddle uh, out on the open coast uh, really will recognize. It's a super common um, kelp, the feather boa kelp. Uh, it really is so odd and different from anything that we recognize. It can have these paddle shaped blades uh, for you paddlers, or it can have really thin needle like blades depending on the environment that it's growing in. It can be very variable. The feather boa kelp is actually doing pretty well in our um, oceans these days. 
So um, it's one of those that we don't have to worry about. And I really have used it as an inspiration to push my work into directions uh, that um, I, I was having a little bit of a block at one point and I realized, oh, I could use the blades of the egregia, the very varied blades as my kind of collage element, as an organic shape to then work with to create these uh, larger abstractions. So I have lots of different series uh, using different egregia blades. And then I push these abstractions even farther, um, especially when COVID came and I was really in my studio, my whole book tour got canceled um, and I was gonna be up your direction and up in Seattle and all that closed down in uh, 2020. Um, but uh, the colors, as you can see, they're just, they're just so rich. And the scanner in particular is very good at translating the color that the specimen is. You all are probably aware of how variable color can be uh, with a traditional camera. It all is dependent on the light source, whether it's a cloudy day or a sunny day, or you're inside with different light sources. Um, but the scanner is very, very consistent. Those parameters are fixed. The other thing I started doing, um, uh, probably when I was writing about, um, about Anna Atkins, was um, who was a was a kind of a famous Victorian polymath. Um, she uh, um, made cyanotype prints of her algal collection in the 1840s and made a famous book called Cyanotype Impressions of British uh, Algae. And so in her honor, I started making some cyanotypes in my own backyard. Um, and um, she uh, inspired me and what you have on the right is this funny seaweed called cytosiphon, which really is this sausagey brown seaweed. And then I realized as I was making more and more of the uh, cyanotypes, which is this really easy kind of precursor to the gelatin silver print photography that we all, that, that we all know, which of course was the precursor to the digital photography. This is really was a nascent photographic process. Um, but I realized that it was in this lineage of nature printing, where you're making an image directly from a specimen with all of its nuances. It's not um, mitigated by a botanical illustrator's eye or hand or the lens of a camera. Um, and I realized that my, my scanning technique was also really operating in this lineage of nature printing. So I thought, well, what if my, I could digitize my, my cyanotypes and then, and then place the scan of the same specimen in dialogue with its shadow, with its white ghostly shadow. So I've made a whole series where this, this kind of dialogue between a contemporary process with a historical process um, uh, kind of um, uh, plays out. This is a wonderful um, red seaweed called Apuntiella. And it's very deep red. It's when you are looking at a whole bunch of rack of the red seaweeds, it's got almost a deeper red than, than many of the others. And again, it's kind of playing with its shadow here. Um, all of this experimentation um, has led me into the research uh, uh, that goes into the writing of the books. Um, this is a, a little bit of a later piece in the last um, year or so, and it's become really the signature image of our kelp fest, uh, which I'll tell you about at the very end. But here again, I've placed a whole bunch of my scans of bull kelp in this case, or nereocystis, uh, on top of some cyanotypes or intertwined with some of the cyanotype prints from those same blades of bull kelp. Um, I had some more, I was very much uh, trying to experiment with over using maps in my artwork at this point. And then I had to just, wasn't working and I took the maps away and it's much more successful. And this is really an iconic image of the Stephanocystis or bladder chain rack, um, which is very, very common on our beaches here in California, all up and down this Northern California coast. In fact, I walk very regularly here in San Francisco at my a uh, beach out on the coast, um, which is called Fort Funston. And we've just had huge scouring events, these big storms, which have really pulled 
huge amounts of sand off of our beach. And we've really had no rack, no kind of nothing really interesting washing up on shore. And I was out there just the other day and there was one tiny piece of seaweed and this was it, the top portion of the um, Stephanocystis, uh, which is so beautiful. So I've overlaid my scan here with um, a historical lithograph um, from the taxonomic record. It's from 1853 and it's from the publication that actually named this organism for the first time. And this image actually gave rise to um, my book, The Curious World of Seaweed. So um, The Curious World of Seaweed, I hope many of you have found it. I know, Ken, you mentioned you've read it. I hope you all will go to Powell's and or wherever you live and go to your bookstore and, and have them order it for you. Um, it's 16 essays about 16 iconic Pacific coast kelps and seaweeds. And these are the seaweeds that you will really encounter either on the beach or in the tide pool. Um, and the precursor to that was An Ocean Garden, The Secret Life of Seaweed, which um, was first published in 2014, but it's just been re-released in the last year by Oregon State University Press. So OSU Press has um, re-released An Ocean Garden, and I'm so thrilled, especially they have such amazing marine science there. Um, so ask for that also in your bookstore because the more we keep these books alive and we keep the publishers knowing that, that we're interested in them, um, the better. So The Curious World of Seaweed is 16 chapters, about 16 seaweeds. But I wanna reiterate that that's just a tiny, tiny fraction of the incredible biodiversity of the marine algae or seaweeds that we are lucky enough to be in the proximity of on coastal Oregon and coastal Northern California. Um, and going up through coastal um, Washington state and British Columbia and Alaska. I mean, this zone that we're in is just a, the richest of the rich zone. There are hundreds and hundreds of species um, and part of that richness comes from this notion of upwelling. So this is a picture taken in Northern California in Mendocino. There's a state park called McCarricker State Park. And it's taken in the spring when the Northwest winds come in um, on our coast and on, in, on the Oregon coast as well, where the, these Northwest winds pick up and push the surface waters away. And that allows this deep upwelling of cold, nutrient dense waters. And it's this nutrient dense cold ocean water that not only the, the marine life, the other marine life, but the algae need for their robust growth. And I think cold ocean is really um, one of the key elements to uh, keeping these organisms healthy and successful in their, in their zone. So this is a picture of the kelp rack also uh, there in Northern California. And it it's really to say, look at all the different color, texture, shape. Um, there's such an amalgam that is washed up right here. And it's just an indication of the diversity of species uh, and uh, marine algal life that is right there uh, in the intertidal zone and in the subtidal zone, which is a little bit deeper uh, and out a little bit deeper than that. So this allows me to kind of um, get into a little bit of the, the, um, the science of the seaweeds or some information about how you could go about kind of identifying the seaweeds that you're finding when you're paddling around and then you pull up on the beach and you go out um, into, onto a, a tide pool, great tide pool place, you know, what are you seeing and how do you um, start to kind of identify it? And one of the first ways to, categorize the algae is by color. Um, the, the greens, the red, and the brown algae are the basic taxonomic or evolutionary lineages of the algae. And the green algae um, were um, derived from cyanobacteria. They have just chlorophyll in their chloroplasts. So it's just the green chlorophyll that's collecting the photons. Uh, that's then driving photosynthesis. And it's the green algae that migrated up onto shore and became the plants on land. Uh, and so all of the greenery of our terrestrial world is from the green algae. It's the chlorophyll from 
green algae. Now, long, long, long ago, the red algae split off from the greens and they developed two accessory pigments, a red and a blue accessory pigment that combine to make this incredible array of magentas and purples um, and deep reds, almost so deep a red or purple that they can seem black. Um, and these accessory pigments actually collect different wavelengths of light. And again, this is an indication of this incredible ingenuity uh, that the seaweeds present to us because um, different wavelengths of light than what we know on land, which is really heavy in the red spectrum, different wavelengths actually penetrate the density of ocean water. Uh, and the red and blue accessory pigments are much better at picking up those different wavelengths of collecting the photons. And then there is uh, chlorophyll in there to drive uh, photosynthesis, but the, the photon collection is predominantly through these accessory pigments. Then later in the evolutionary um, lineup, the brown seaweeds came along quite a bit later. Uh, they're really actually very distantly related to the red and the green seaweeds. And they, the brown seaweeds have a brown accessory pigment that mixes with the chlorophyll to make this incredible array of golden color and olives and deep browns. And the kelps are a subset of the browns and kelps can typically be identified because they have a bladder and they have more differentiated um, uh, structure. Um, so that's your kind of basic um, uh, seaweed uh, color scheme. Um, and I go into the history of this. William Henry Harvey was this amazing uh, guy in, in Ireland who came up with those three groupings that stand today. And I use this seaweed, the Maziella, as I um, have mentioned earlier, as my signature um, uh, species for the color chapter in the Curious World of Seaweed book, because once it dries, it dries to this kind of perfect purple, which is this perfect combination of the red and the blue pigments coming together. I also have a chapter in the book on coral and algae. And again, I hope that once these, um, these kinds of algae are pointed out to you, you can go into the intertidal in your ex expeditions and your explorations and start noticing. And the coral and algae um, come in two different kinds. There's the encrusting coralline, which encrusts usually on rocks. But in this image on the right-hand side, it's encrusted on this bottle. And then there's articulated coralline, which is on the left here, which has uh, these uh, fingers, these bony fingers. Now the coralline algae takes a different strategy towards success in the intertidal zone than the leafy seaweeds, which um, have to um, kind of grow in the presence of voracious herbivores. And herbivores are all those invertebrates like chitons and, and um, limpets and snails and sea urchin that all are love to eat algae. Now these coralline algae have said, well, we're gonna grow a protective armor of calcium carbonate in our cell walls, and it makes them not very tasty and much harder to eat. Uh, but as a result, they grow much more slowly. So you'll notice usually these articulated coralline, they need to stay pretty wet. So they tend to um, skirt the uh, tide pools. And the coral and algae, as I said, it tends to, it grows right on the rock. So it will uh, create this kind of pink underlayer to the intertidal, the, the rocky reef that you're, that you're encountering. Um, the coral and algae actually gives off uh, signals to the larval stage of invertebrates saying, this is a place that you want to settle. So it's very, very important. I have a whole nother chapter on the seagrasses. Um, this is, these are some scans of the eelgrass uh, or uh, Zostra marina, which grows in the estuaries and sort of calmer bays. Uh, that's, this is what grows in the bay here in San Francisco, in the Elkhorn Slough, um, in lots of your estuarine um, places where your rivers come out uh, into the ocean. Um, it's a little wider than the other seagrass, which is called phyllospadix or um, surf grass. And surf grass, both of these, Phyllospadix and um, Zostra, they um, are grasses, they're not algae. They actually are plants that recolonize the seawater. They re-evolved back from land into an ocean environment, which is super interesting. And the surf grass actually migrated out into the open coast, and that's where you'll find it. It's much thinner. I think I have a picture of it here. 
um, in this textbook uh, over on the left there, you'll see how thin that that's phyto, phyllosphatix. Um, and that's a drawing done by the great E.L. Dawson in his um, marine botany textbook. Now, these are plants. Um, what I'm showing on the right is it's kind of a rhizomy root system. They're actually proper roots, whereas the seaweeds don't have roots. They just have a hold fast. I'll get into that a little bit more later. But they also, these, these surf grasses have flowers, flowering, flowering. They are flowering plants that have flowers that create seeds. And this illustration shows you um, the seeds of the phyllospadix has these little kind of wings that come out and that's to hook onto things and it often hooks onto the coralline algae so that it stays in place uh, long enough to set down its rhizomy roots. So there's so, I, I have more chapters, I have a whole chapter on the postelsia or sea palm, um, but in, um, there's, I, so I really hope you get to read uh, through the whole book, either of the books. I, I have so many more seaweeds in there to learn about. But I want to talk about bull kelp because bull kelp is the dominant uh, canopy forming kelp from down here in at the bay around um, oh, Monterey or Big Sur um, up all the way through Oregon, Washington, Puget Sound, British Columbia and Southeast and Southwest Alaska. Its biogeography is our the northeastern edge of the Pacific Ocean. And it's just such a spectacular organism. And both here in California and in Oregon, there has been this huge decline in our bull kelp forests. So I think it's just really important that we know this organism, that we revere it, that we respect it, um, that we really kind of um, kind of get to know its its magic and its majesty. Uh, but it's also really good to just teach us a little bit about the architecture of the seaweed. So as I mentioned, the seaweeds have a holdfast instead of a root system. And you see this relatively small holdfast on these two juvenile bull kelp here on the left. There's a little tiny bit of red seaweed attached. Um, and then you have a stipe, which is very wiggly and, and can expand with um, the currents or the wave action of the oceans. So you have a bladder called a pneumatocyst, which is gas filled and is serving to bring the blades, which are what these fronds are called, not, not leaves, but blades, um, up towards the surface to photosynthesize uh, as efficiently as possible. And right about now in March, late February, March, early April is when these tiny baby bull kelp should be um, kind of starting their year of growth. And the bull kelp is an annual. That means that they do go through their whole cycle, their whole life cycle in about 12 to 18 months. And then they get ripped up by the winter storms and thrown either on shore or into the deep ocean. So right now is when the baby bull kelps, the longer days of spring are sparking this new growth. Um, it's called the sporophyte because it's the spores that are uh, growing here. Um, the book has lots of clues with using different um, collectors. You'll see the Mrs. J.M. Weeks there was the collector of this beautiful baby um, uh, um, bull kelp in Pacific Grove, and probably in the 1890s is when she collected that. And over on the right are some babies from the UC Berkeley um, or University Herbarium, which has got the collection of marine algae along the entire West Coast is there at um, UC Berkeley. An incredible collection. Now in just a matter of months, from now, from mid-March to July, say, this kelp will grow, can grow, if it's in the right situation, up to 60 feet. It will grow this massive stipe. It will grow a big eight inch in diameter bulb. And then it will stream out 60 or so of these blades. And it's just this spectacular organism and it does all that growth using um, holding on to a rocky bottom, the power of sunlight to fuel photosynthesis and the nutrients of a cold ocean, a nutrient dense ocean, um, because it needs to absorb all those nutrients, the magnesium, potassium, sodium from the ocean, the iodine uh, to, um, to grow. So here are some photos by a wonderful photographer named Marco Maza, and it really shows you um, the, a bull kelp forest in late spring um, as these bladders are really pulling that uh, fast growing stipe 
up to the surface to get those blades up to the surface. Once the bladder hits the surface, growth stops along the stipe and the point of growth shifts to the place between the bulb and the blades. That's called the meristem. The point of, of growth is called the meristem. It's really, that's kind of a remarkable phenomenon. Um, but as I said, the bull kelp is an annual which makes it in one sense a little more vulnerable. It has to reproduce before the winter storms come in the fall and winter. So by late August, early September, um, you will start seeing these sore eye patches on the blades of the bull kelp. And you see these on bull kelp washed ashore. You see them on bull kelp um, growing out in healthy kelp forests. And these dark brown patches are patches of millions of spores and they kind of darken as they migrate out uh, to the end of the blade. And you can see some holes here where the patches literally just fall away. Um, it's really kind of a remarkable phenomenon. And they float down to uh, the ocean bottom near the, um, the, the parent kelp. So it's probably a good environment for, for more bull kelp to grow. And then those spores actually divide and grow into and germinate into a male and a female organism. So there is a whole alternate generation of the bull kelp that plays out under the ocean in the winter months in a microscopic way. So it develops into these gametophytes, a male and a female organism that are microscopic, that hang out and at some point a sperm is released and a tiny pheromone trail is released from the egg that attracts the sperm and it's, it's um, fertilized. And that fertilized egg is what grows into the sporophyte, this enormous bull kelp that we know. So that alternate generation is very mysterious. Um, they can make it happen in the lab, but how it plays out in the ocean, in the wild, it's in very um, difficult territory to examine. It's during the winter. It's under waves, it's in rock cracks, and it's microscopic. Um, but as an artist, I just love, these are some of the images that I've made from those uh, sore eye patches. Um, and uh, I've just printed up a couple uh, as a gift to a friend of mine. So um, I want to take you through the situation on our Northern California coast, which is not that dissimilar to the situation on your Southern Oregon coast, where you have some historic kelp beds that have really <clears throat> seen historic decline. Um, I follow the Oregon coast, uh, the ORCA, which is Oregon Kelp Alliance very closely. Um, I can talk about that more particularly in, with some questions, um, but um, it's not a dissimilar story to what I'm gonna tell you has happened here on our Northern California coast. So 2008 was a gangbuster year for kelp. Uh, you can see that, um, you know, a heron could literally walk across uh, this um, kelp bed. And in 2017, I was back out uh, on this, in this same place at Van Damme State Park in Mendocino, and the bed was still there, of course, much more spaced out. Um, but over the more recent years, 2019, 2020, 2021, I drive up the coast and I stop at a pullout that's right here overlooking Van Damme uh, Bay. And it's it's like this, there's no kelp at all. And it's beautiful, the water's clear, the beach is sandy white. It's actually been trashed by recent storms, but there's nothing to say anything is wrong unless you know that something is missing. So that's really very much part of my mission as an artist and a storyteller is to make sure we remind ourselves what we're forgetting. And when I was snorkeling there in 2017, this is what I encountered plenty of still the healthy bull kelp like on the left, but I also got to see the sea urchins in action. The sea urchins having come out of their cracks. Uh, this was a otherwise healthy piece of bull kelp that was still attached to the ocean bottom but the urchin had pinned its blades to a vertical rock face and were munching down its blades. And what's happened uh, as uh, some warming ocean events uh, really stressed the kelp and um, made the kelp less available, the urchins um, came out of their cracks and started eating all of the kelp they could find until there, was, until there was absolutely nothing left. And you have what you see here, which is an urchin barren. And this is this rock that is completely 
devoid of other uh, algal life uh, and you have just a carpet of purple urchin in particular. So the sea urchin um, typically have two top predators that have kept balance in the system, in the kelp forest system. And the, one of the you know, most famous top predators has not been on the Oregon coast or the Northern California coast in any real way since the 1840s. Uh, and that is the sea otter. The sea otter were hunted to extirpation where they were extirpated. Um, they were hunted for their fur, their lustrous, lustrous fur. And while there was one um, sea otter reintroduction event in Oregon in the early 1970s, those otters did not survive. Uh, they were kind of around and monitored for about a year in the 1970s, and then they disappeared. Those otters in Oregon were actually translocated from the Aleutian Islands, from Amchitka Island. In central California, we have sea otter around Monterey Peninsula. And those otters actually migrated up from a lone, lone refugial population in Big Sur that was tucked away in uh, one of the coves in Big Sur. Now, there's another um, uh, sea urchin uh, predator called the sunflower sea star. And this is the Pycnopodia helianthoides, this big pizza pie sized 20 armed starfish known as the wolves of the sea because they're such effective urchin predators. And the these guys were really holding down the position of top predator to the sea urchin and keeping those sea urchin populations in check, at least keeping them afraid and in their cracks. But in 2014, the very end of 2013, 2014, uh, the sea star wasting disease uh, really um, took out all sea stars on the entire west coast of North America. And while other sea stars have come back, the ochre stars, et cetera, the sunflower sea stars have not. And on the Oregon coast and the California coast, there are no Pycnopodia helianthoides. There are some up in the northern areas in northern British Columbia and in Alaska, but on our coasts, um, there are no urchin predators. And what that has meant is just an overabundance of purple urchin. The red urchin are bigger and there's actually a market. There's a fishery of red urchin. So the red urchin are kept in check by us, by us fishers. Um, but the purple urchin have had no fishery. Uh, they're too small and there's all sorts of work going on right now uh, in so many ways with tribes, with um, other groups to find commercial uses for the purple urchin. Um, so this was my piece that I made uh, when I was writing the chapter on bull kelp in 2017 for Curious World of Seaweed. And it was really when it was becoming a clear that the um, bull kelp forests on the Mendocino and Sonoma coasts were in steep decline. The, the Oregon coast at that point were still healthy, but the same thing happened to them a few years later. And now around Port Orford, those historic kelp beds there are pretty much decimated. So at that, as soon as the, the Curious World of Seaweed was published, I knew I wanted to continue telling this bull kelp story. I've been very entangled ever since in the mysterious world of bull kelp. Um, uh, this is again, one of my scans overlaid into a cyanotype. And I wanted to tell the bull kelp story across its range. So this is really the genesis of the work that I've been doing now, my most recent work. And I'm gonna be pretty quick here so we have time for questions. But what I'm showing here is a map of the coast of, um, of the Western coast of North America tipped sideways and showing the range of bull kelp from about Point Sur um, and Monterey all the way up along out to the middle of the Aleutians. So I wanted to choose these different places along that biogeography to say, how does bull kelp play out? In Oregon and Northern California, we're in absolute crisis mode. Uh, but up in Southeast Alaska, there's tons of bull kelp. And why is that? It's mostly because sea otter are present or sea otter and sunflower sea stars are present. And um, we don't, don't have those in other places. So um, I got to snorkel up in uh, Mendocino. This is a historic kelp bed right off of the town of Mendocino that has since really been decimated by um, sea urchins just in the last two years. This photo was taken in 2021. And this now is a site for a restoration effort 
that my partner Mariana and I above below are being the kind of outreach component to, which is very exciting. We have lots planned for that. Um, and those little kelp that I, you saw me, you know, pulling that kind of were floating in that kelp bed. It was a, about April when I was um, snorkeling there, um, were scanned and made into these huge uh, 13 foot tall banners that hung in the 836M gallery in San Francisco. So I really wanted to work with maps because it was gonna be a regional story and I really wanted to research these historical kelp indicators. Um, this is a NOAA chart uh, from the 1880s and it shows this continuous squiggle of kelp, these, these hand-drawn kelp squiggles that indicate the kelp beds, a miles long kelp bed uh, that was there in the 1880s uh, that now is really what has disappeared. Um, there were also aerial surveys done by California Fish and Wildlife um, that made this other data that I found kind of incomprehensible. So I just made some artwork out of it. Um, and then there are these historical charts from 1911 that were made all up and down uh, the West Coast. And they were made by the US Department of Agriculture because they, they were interested in finding sources for potassium sulfates for agriculture for, for fertilizer. Big ag was just coming into being and sources uh, for, for fertilizer were um, being looked for. So these surveys were done by the equivalent of kayakers like you. It was done in a dory. Um, a ship would go up the coast and then the dory would be rowed around the kelp beds and it would be measured. Um, so this is again, Northern California, but these I actually have a whole set of these um, maps like right here in my studio. But one of the most interesting things about maps and kelp is that they're not, I found they weren't the most useful way to get information. I really, I thought they would be, but kelp is so ephemeral. It changes from year to year. And what I have be, below, behind here in the text, so I'll highlight here is, it happens that this year, 1912, this is an explanation that went along with those historic maps. Uh, the year 1912 was an unusually poor one for a kelp harvest. Um, uh, uh, as will be explained more later, most of the beds were thinner than usual and especially along the Northern coast section. Some beds were being very thin and practically non-existent where usually very heavy stands prevailed. And what I'm showing overlaid on top is a graph made by Meredith McPherson for her PhD thesis in 2021, excuse me, where she was charting using satellite data, the canopy of bull kelp and its abundance in Mendocino and, um, and Sonoma counties. That's what the region is. And you can see how incredibly variable it is. So if you're looking at a map, where, where in time are you? It doesn't, it's not that informative or it can be very misleading. If we look at that year, 2018, that really was a gangbuster year, but was it a, was an indicator year, was it a typical year? Um, so that's where I felt that um, I really kind of didn't want to use, I was stuck, I was stymied. I was playing with these kelp maps and not feeling like they were great for teaching. And that's when I was um, approached by Mariana Loischel, who's here with me and we created Above Below. And she is a design a designer, a longstanding designer, um, that had been working with um, landscape networks and lives on the on the north coast and wanted to really bring her design um, chops to the kelp forest story. And someone said, well, meet Josie. And so we got together and we decided that uh, the book proposal that I was writing about bull kelp, about this regional, cross-regional story, uh, really we pivoted to say, let's make a website. So that's what we did. And we made the mysterious world of bull, uh, of bull kelp. Uh, so I hope you all will go. Maybe, um, Patty, you could put the uh, bullkelp.info in the chat so people could click on it later or at least have it pulled up to really explore it later. Um, but we worked with a wonderful illustrator named Ellen Litwiller um, and made this uh, homepage illustration where you really go down into the kelp forest. And you can click on the characters. So the idea is that you can, you can navigate this either by character, abalone, the sea urchin, the sunflower sea star, and gain deep information about each of these characters, or you can explore it by region. Um, so you can go to each of those regions and read this very deep 
information. So this is the, in, the, the Kelp Forest community page, which explains the trophic food web. And then you can go to each of the characters. Um, this is just an example of the header of our bull kelp page, which is of course our hero, our protagonist, photographed by Jackie Hildering, who's an amazing photographer up in British Columbia. Um, the sea urchin uh, had a similar um, uh, image on that as a header. And this is just some examples of some of the information on these pages. We actually re redrew life cycles so they would all be similar. So you can really understand the fact that say the sea urchin are broadcast spawners um, and these life cycles have all sorts of ramifications for their interrelationship with the kelp forest itself. Um, and some photographs by wonderful photographer, Abby Diaz. So I really got to be curator as well as the author. I wrote all of the text and it really started from this premise that the bull kelp is a coastwide species with regional dramas. So each of these regions these characters that we, you've gotten to know play out in different ways in each of these regions with the resu different results in terms of the health of the kelp forest. And as I mentioned, Southeast Alaska is really different than Oregon and uh, California because their bull, bull kelp is in great shape. They have abundant beds, their water is cold, but they have something different than what we have on the Oregon coast and the California coast, which is very linear and the bull kelp is out in the dynamic wave action areas, their bull kelp um, is in these channels where currents are very strong. It's the channels between islands in Southeast Alaska and British Columbia. Um, and it's really where I learned that, that um, bull kelp is a flow hound. It likes to be where the current is bringing in that added nutrient as opposed to wave dynamics. So we made our own maps uh, for this whole project. I was very picky about what they would look like. It was very hard to find bathymetric charts that were beautiful to orient us to where we are. So we went ahead and made our own. Um, and here you can see the type of information we have on each page. Um, you can see the, the Puget Sound page here right in the middle. We have a whole um, bunch of information about the Squaxin Island tribe and their kelp bed. We've tried to bring indigenous stories in wherever we can because it's just very important to kind of learn these different relationships to the kelp. Um, and we do up on the top right, you'll see, I have this section for every uh, regional page that tells you whether the sea otter and the sunflower sea star are actually there in that region. Um, we have a kelps page and we have all sorts of other resources. So the resources um, are really an important part of this website. This is where our advisors, it was very collaborative. Um, but I can't stress enough how important those resources are because what it does is allow you to go into the Oregon page and find out about the Oregon Kelp Alliance, find out about the Alaka Alliance, which is super involved in getting sea otter uh, reintroduced on the Oregon coast as a kelp rehabilitation uh, effort. And these are some of the words that um, our survey brought back to us in terms of people uh, describing the website to us. And it just makes my heart sing as an author. And we also have been doing these art events adjacent to the website. And these art events, this was the exhibit in San Francisco. Um, we're planning some more right now up on the North Coast. Uh, these art events are ways to bring people into the play, into a place to then talk about the science, to have film screenings, food events, uh, tribes in to talk about their, where they're doing incredible work in the realm of seaweed and, and kelp restoration. These are the five foundational kelps, and I'll finish up here, um, a, a cast kelp. Um, this is the project that I did at Ocean Shores in 2022. I was invited up. And we, um, Duncan Berry was the mastermind um, and um, uh, um, uh, Frank Boyden was the, um, the artist and mastermind. And we made this incredible kelp forest on the beaches there at Ocean Shores. And you can see we even got the sori in there. It was amazing. It was an incredible event. Um, so I'll finish there. I just wanna have a couple more um, things. I'm, I'm hosting a workshop well, I'll go back one here is please do be in touch with me if you want to get onto my newsletter list. I'm at Josie Islin on Instagram and Josie Islin at lovingblind.com. Uh, Patty, you can put that in the 
because I'm happy to put you on my newsletter so you can get updates on all my various events, um, order the books, sign up for doing a workshop in France this spring. We need three more people to sign up to make it a go. It's going to be really amazing. Uh, email me if you're interested. And then I just want to finish here with this kelp fest that we're having, um, the Mendocino kelp fest. There's so much that's going to be going on there and it's at northcoastkelpfest.org. And I'll put that in the chat. So I'm going to finish there and I hope we have some time for questions. I see some, um, notes in the chat and Patty, should I stop sharing or should I keep it on a picture? Um, I think a picture is fine. Um, uh, Janelle had a question. She says, are the scanned seaweed flat or bulbous? They're usually flat. I can put them bulbous on my scanner. If I am holding, I can use kind of stones and things to hold the top off of pushing, making them too flat. So, um, I can scan, I, you'll, you'll have noticed I've kind of sliced the bull kelp often, um, so they're not as three-dimensional, but I can capture dimensionality. I also do press my seaweeds with a classic plant press and make them pretty flat, and then they're, then they're pretty flat. So I do it both ways. Looks like Jim has a question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, still kind of blown away by this presentation, Josie, thank you. Thank you so much. Just unbelievable mix of art and science and 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 policy and thinking is just really unbelievable. So thank you so much. But you know, as a many of us are conservationists and we're paddling around and we seek help, um, our tendency might be to avoid it. Uh, that would be mine. Uh, let it be, so to speak. But what should we do in addition to informing ourselves when we're conservation minded? and we seek help areas. So one of the things you might do is connect with the Oregon Kelp Alliance. And that's, there's a wonderful guy named Tom, um, oh my gosh, what's Tom's last name? The or it's orca.orka, um, and I could, could you, we can find them um, online and put their thing in the chat. And one of the things that, um, in Puget Sound and other places, it might be a little harder on the open coast, but people need, they need surveyors and you kayakers could be really useful in surveying kelp beds from the surface. They definitely do surface as divers, but they might really appreciate you guys uh, being in touch with them. I know they just did some community outreach in Port Orford in particular. That's where the Oregon Kelp Alliance is based. Um, Tom Calvanese is his name. He's kind of the, the mastermind of the Oregon Kelp Alliance, orca, O-R-K-A dot org, I believe. And um, they could very well use you guys, I think, first of all, knowing it, knowing what it is. Um, if it has sori, you know, you could take the sori and you could scatter them around. Um, noticing if finding out what kind of kelp restoration work the orca is doing there in Oregon and seeing how you could be a part of it. Um, they often need people to collect urchins. So they, we have a whole, the, the reef check is um, the group and we have many links to them on our website on the resources page. They're the group that trains citizen science divers uh, who go out and not only do the surveys, but also will do the harvesting of the purple urchin, which is one of the first steps towards kelp recovery. Wow. Cool, thank you, outstanding. There's another question from Lynn. She says, how do you scan the very large kelp on your scanner? <laughs> well, um, I'm not afraid of things being goopy in here. I have like a big bin that I'll, I'll, I'll stage it out in my yard, which is just right out here. And I, I will slice off, as I just mentioned, if it's very big and thick, I'll slice off one side. So one side can sit flat on the scanner and then I might scan it in sections. I have to, to um, you know, stitch the sections together. Um, and then it's, you know, fortunately my scanner, the, the platen the, is glass and glass is impervious. So that's really nice. And I have my, um, if I just, uh, always sitting next to my scanner is the glass cleaner um, <laughs> because 
<laughs> it does get salty, but it cleans very nicely. And I'm, I'm careful. Um, and it just takes a little bit of can do spirit. I have a question. How, how big you had some pictures, some historic pictures of of little baby bull kelp. I couldn't get it. How big are those? So the the babies, like right now, I mean, when they begin, and you often will see them at the ocean's edge because they do get washed up, pulled up. They're they're a uh, little tiny golden bladder might be as big as your the top of your thumb. Wow. Really tiny, um, and that and the stipe might be that long. Yeah. And you do find, I mean, that's one of the things of if there's a healthy kelp forest out there, all it'll just be growing so much, things will be floating in. Um, but one of the things that I'm finding is that I just not having the kelp rack on the beaches like there used to be, um, which is an indication that they're just not offshore like they used to be. Do we have any more questions that anyone can think of put it in the chat um there's lots of i don't know if you'll be able to review some of these comments later josie but um all really positive the use of the website to support other events art and education is impressive great presentation um stunning beautiful so um i just put the north coast kelp fest in the chat as well um, please come down and join us. It's going to be a place to learn. I know that the um, the Bass, the Bay Area Sea Kayakers group already, you know, after my talk, were like, oh my gosh, how can we get it? They always do a paddle up uh, at some time in the year up on the North Coast. So I think some of them are going to try and get there. It's going to have lots of different, if you explore the schedule page of that northcoastkelpfest.org Um website there's just so many opportunities there's going to be a film festival uh, with kelp films featured um, lots of art workshops and at, at every point it's really to bring in what restoration work is happening right there at mendocino at that um, kelp bed that i showed um showed you a picture of where i was kind of walking in uh with my snorkel gear um because that's a big a big restoration site that's just beginning so it's going to be pretty exciting and fun and it's always beautiful up there. Just like, just like your coast. It's amazing. Wow. Josie, thank you so much. This was more than I ever expected. Just this amazing combination of science and art and our environment and animals. And it's just, I, I'm, my mind is blown. <laughs> thank you so much. Well, please, I encourage anybody to be in touch with me. Uh, you know, my email, I think, was in there. Um, I'm at Josie Islin at lovingblind.com or my website because I really, um, I do keep a robust, uh, well, I do a sporadic newsletter, but um, there's all sorts of things going on in the kelp world that's really, really interesting. And you guys are kind of frontline being paddlers out there. You really are. And there's all sorts of stuff going on with the tribes in terms of kelp um, monitoring and canoeing and the Puget Sound Restoration Fund is going to do this whole kelp expedition again with kayakers up there. And I feel like you you really have this common thread with other groups across the biogeography of bull kelp um, that really, really connects you to this to this organism and to the other groups that are that are really thinking about it a lot so fantastic well i think everyone's been inspired thank you yeah, thank awesome you, josie. take care okay good night everybody good night thank you josie hey so we have a, one more thing stick around folks we've got one more um quick uh presentation by gay lewis and gay is an oops member here she is amazing. She's a she's a 36 year educator, 11 years of it being a librarian, and she's got an educational media degree and she's done some amazing things with our oops library turning it into an online system so gay. Um, gay and Jim take it away let's hear about the library. Hello, um, well, I know you're now all inspired to get out on the ocean. And if, if, if you're not, and you need a little bit more inspiration or you just want more information, our OOPS library does have books on ocean paddling, surprise. 
Um, Nigel Foster, one of the classic uh, books. Gordon Brown, I know you've heard of him. The Sea Kayakers Handbook and many more. And I'm gonna show you real quickly if you're interested in these books, um, how to find them. So hang on just a minute. I'm going to share my screen and... All right, here we go. Okay, can you see the OPS page? Yeah. yeah, okay. So what you wanna do is go to information, go to the library, click on the link right here and that takes you to our online catalog. And there you have our library. You can search for titles, authors, subjects, or you can just watch the scroll down below. Here is a sea kayaking link. You can click on sea kayaking. And here are all of the books that we have on sea kayaking. And what you can do is find the one you want. And in fact, we do have one down here at the bottom. Um, about California. So if you're interested in going down to the Bay Area, you can uh, find the one, which is way at the bottom, I'm sure, but we have Alaska and we have Baja. Here we go. Guide to Sea Kayaking in Central and Northern California. Click on that. It tells you all the information. If you want to check it out, you check it out. The password is hard to know kayak there you go and find your name when you find your name like uh check this out to steve blackwood you want to check it out all you have to do is check it out and uh arrange you'll get an email <clears throat> i'll get an email and we can talk about how to get the book to you, whether that be at the meeting or whether we're gonna meet someplace or whether I'm going to mail it to you. So it's as simple as that. And I know that uh, I mean, this was such an amazing presentation. We're all inspired to get out onto the ocean. So if you haven't had the courage yet or you want more information, um, start thinking about it by checking out some of these books. Anybody have any questions? Thank you, Gay.